Well, this morning we find ourselves back in the book of Jude. We've gone through the first eight, of, eight verses of 25, and uh, my attempt today is to go through the rest of the verses. Jude is uh, an interesting book because we know that, first of all, he was intimately involved in who Jesus was because he was his half-brother, along with James. So we understand the author and we understand that what he speaks of is a warning. The book of Jude is great for us because we're closer to the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ now than any people on earth have ever been. And we get to see all of these things kind of unfolding before us. The book speaks of apostasy, which is a turning away from God and turning away from Jesus Christ as the sacrificial substitute for our sin. And so that's what apostasy is, and it's essentially what the book is about. The passage I brought from 1 John 2.19 says, And they went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out that they might be made manifest that none of them were of us. John speaking about those who once gathered with the church, that once had a faith that appeared to be living, that seemed to be a relational uh, experience with the Lord God through Jesus Christ, and yet they left and they walked away. So as we get into the book, if you would pray with me that we ask God's blessing on this time. Father, what a tremendous privilege it is to be able to meet in this place with your people around your word, with the presence of your spirit here. We thank you. We thank you that you undertake to protect, to provide, and Lord, that you care for us. I thank you, Lord, that we're healthy and that you've given us air to breathe and another day to live. I pray that you might help us to submit ourselves to you today, that our hearts and our minds and the occupation of our bodies might be that which pleases you. So, Lord, we just want to dedicate ourselves to you and pray that you would use each one of us today to be instruments of your love and grace. Be with us now as we open your word, that you might help it to find a fertile place in our heart to grow. In Jesus' name, amen. So last week, we got through the first several verses. I'll just recap. Jude, which we know is the half-brother of Jesus, a bondservant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to those who are called, sanctified by God the Father, and preserved in Jesus Christ, mercy, peace, and love be multiplied to you. Beloved, while I was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation, I found it necessary to write to you exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all delivered to the saints. For certain men have crept in unnoticed, long ago were marked out for this condemnation, godly men, ungodly men, who turned the grace of God into lewdness and deny the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. But I want to remind you, though you once knew this, that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterwards destroyed those who did not believe. And the angels who did not keep their proper domain, but left their own abode, he has reserved in everlasting chains under darkness for the judgment of the great day. As Sodom and Gomorrah, And the cities around them, in a similar manner to these, having given themselves over to sexual immorality and gone after strange flesh, are set forth as an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. So we're going to pick it up from verse 8, which we discussed a little bit last time. And it's kind of a segue into the rest of it. He says, likewise, also these dreamers, these apostates, They defile the flesh, they reject authority, and speak evil of dignitaries. So these are three things that you can note about people who have turned their back on God. They basically become a God of their own selves, and they do whatever it is they feel like doing. They have a problem with authority. How many of you have a problem? No, never mind. (laughs) Or speak evil of those in positions of authority. So you'll notice that these are the characteristic Uh, things that come out of an apostate because they've rejected God's authority, so they're going to reject everyone else's authority. So 
Israel in the desert is exactly what they did. The fallen angels is exactly what they did. And then Sodom and Gomorrah, it's exactly what they did, which are our previous examples. And so my question is, have you seen the news recently? Uh, you may have been glued to your TV, to the news, or to the internet, but there are all sorts of things going on. There are constant acronyms being added to the LGBTQQIAAP. So there are more and more people with the Me Too mentality which are jumping on the bandwagon and just completely discarding anything that is historical, anything that has been uh, the normative, it's completely cast off for that which is uh, important to God as we understand. Uh, and rejection of authority, uh, defunding the police, uh, trying to take away uh, the police presence at all. In fact, there are people proponing, uh, being proponents of having no police force whatsoever. Well, that's all well and good until you need them. It's like, we don't need fire extinguishers until there's a fire, and you know it's a good thing we have them. There are people who are marching. You've got Antifa. You've got uh, all of these organizations rising up and just against authority. They will not be governed. But the problem is, when you're not governed, you have chaos. And people do whatever they feel like in their, in their sensual, animalistic, sinful nature. And then the world just falls apart. And of course, you can't get away from watching the news without somebody denigrating our president, or the Congress, or our way of life uh, as Americans, which are largely founded upon what the scriptures teach about authority and about private property and honoring that. So there are just so many things going on in our world today that we see this passage is just coming true everywhere around us. So beware of the imagination that is not governed by the Spirit of God, that which is God's disclosed word in his, in his word, and that which is governed by the Spirit of God, which you can only have if you've come into a relation with Jesus Christ as an adopted child. Uh, as we repent of our sins and we give him our life, we recognize what Jesus has done for us, that he is the Savior of the world, that he is God and man, and that he has come to be the substitution for what we deserve and what we've earned. Amen? Amen? That is the essence of the gospel. Beware of the rebellion in your own heart. There may be some of this off-scourging where you feel like you shouldn't be governed. I don't know about you, but the thoughts run through my mind, well, I can fix all this. I mean, I can fix all this. I'll, I'll just, you know, I'll just do what everybody else does. I'll carry weapons and I'll... You know, I'll march and I'll scream and I'll yell and I'll use this platform to cause trouble and, and fight it in the most fleshly of ways. And yet that's not what Jesus Christ would have me do. And so I have to be careful of my own heart that this doesn't rub off and I start thinking, uh, wait till I go see this person. I'm going to lay hands on them in not a good spiritual way <laughs> and straighten out their thinking. And yet, you know, that doesn't ever change a person's heart. That is one of the most frustrating things about life. You cannot change somebody else's mind or their heart. Only God can do that. And so I have to watch my own heart that this doesn't rub off on me, and I start becoming looking like them, but just on another side. And then, of course, beware of the gossip and the disrespect of authority figures. The scripture is very clear to tell us that the Lord is involved in raising up kings and princes, and, and he'll take them down when he wants to. Uh, this was very clear to me when there were those who got voted into office whom I did not vote for. And I found myself having to pray for those that I did not vote for or want in the White House. And, it, and I'm old enough to have a few of those. So I pray for these folks that God would break through and cause his will to be done. And we should be praying for those in authority instead of looking and having thoughts of, boy, wait till I see them. Verse 9, speed bump. Yet Michael, the archangel, in contending with the devil, when he disputed about the body of Moses, dared not bring against him a reviling accusation, but said, the Lord rebuke you. It's an interesting thing how people think they can take authority over those who are in authority. And here Michael, we're told, the archangel, by the way, he's the archangel. He's the top general, by the way, of God's armies. 
His job primarily is to look over Jerusalem, which is uh, interesting. You find that in the book of Daniel. But he is, he's a guy you don't want to run into because he does business. He's, he's with taking your head off. He's there for justice. He's not there to give you good news like Gabriel does. So you don't want to meet up with him on this side of uh, you know, eternity. You want to meet up with him on good terms. You don't want to run into him. So, interesting, Michael the archangel contending with the devil. Did you ever know that Michael contended with the devil? And the crowd went wild. Yes. <laughs> Actually, if you look in the book of Daniel, you see where there was a bit of a battle that he had to come through, and there was some information that had to be given, and uh, Gabriel was on his way, and Michael came and uh, had to take care of business. But anyway, this is a rather interesting thing. Arch the archangel Michael did not go up against the devil toe-to-toe -to -toe and say, you better get out of my way, man, or, you know, I bind you, you know, with the power that I have. You see, he didn't, he didn't get all cocky and authoritative. It's funny because you see a lot of people doing that. And it says, even Michael the archangel, by the way, when, when it comes time to chain down these authorities, principalities, and powers in high places, the Lord's going to pick an angel, just an angel, a regular angel. Not even Michael, not even Gabriel, nobody that you know, just an angel. He, he wasn't that high ranking enough to even mention in the book of Revelation. But he's going to chain them and send them into the pit, the final lake of fire, when it's all done. One angel. So they got some power, and they have some authority, and yet even Michael, who's the boss of them all, he's the top, he's the general, he didn't even come up against the devil with some kind of a railing accusation, you know, you filthy, get behind me, and I'll trample you under my feet, and uh, you hear a lot of Christians talk in such ways with such disrespect towards authorities. Now, certainly they're evil, but the prince of the power of the air is not somebody you should go eyeball to eyeball with. Do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. So don't think you're all that in a bag of chips and you're going to take down the devil single-handedly because you can't. But even Michael contending with the devil, recognizing that he has some authority and he has a place in which God has placed him for a time, allowed him to have, did not dispute. And when he was disputing about the body of Moses, did you know the body of Moses was disputed about it's rather curious. Basically, he went up on Mount Pisgah and he died. And he said the Lord buried him. Apparently, Michael the archangel showed up to bury him. And the devil, wanting to take claim to his body, said, I want his body. And Michael said, no, no, no. The Lord rebuke you. You see, he didn't bring down his own authority, his own power, and shoot off a bunch of stuff off of his lip and crack off at him. He said, the Lord, in other words, I'm under orders to do what I'm going to do, and you're not going to stand in front of me. The Lord rebuke you, which is a rather interesting thing. He dared not bring against him a, re a, re a reviling accusation, but said, the Lord rebuke you. This is written in a book called The Ascension of Moses. Any of you read it? No, it's an apocryphal book. So what do you do when somebody in the Bible takes an apocryphal book and actually quotes from it? Well, it's an interesting thing. Do we recognize this book, the book of Jude, as being authoritative and canon? Uh, that's uh, what we call being authorized. It's coming from God. We certainly do. What do you do when he pulls from an unauthorized pseudopigrapha, which is a false writing? You all go, yes. And there are people that argue about this everywhere, trust me. I'm going to give you a little lesson on what truth is and what absolute truth is. Okay? Truth and absolute truth. They're, they're two different things. Jude is absolute truth. This is God's word. What he just quoted was truth. Is there a problem with truth being an absolute truth? I don't think so. I do it all the time. In fact, let's see if you recognize this poet's writing. You can't always get what you want, but if you try sometimes, you just might find you get what you need. Now, I said that from the pulpit. You guys find this to be true? That actually aligns with scripture, by the way. There's scripture that says you don't get what you want, but if you try sometimes, you just might find you get what you need. I'm not going to dance and sing it for you. 
<laughs> I'm rebuking myself because I felt like going off, but I'm not. So you recognize the prophet as Mick Jagger and the Rolling Stones who said, is it true? Of course it's true. You know, the Lord says he'll provide our every need. It says that, you know, consider the lilies of the field. They don't spin, and yet the grass is clothed with these things better than Solomon. God clothes the grass, which is here today and gone tomorrow. If he so clothes the grass, then you of little faith, don't you think he's going to take care of your needs? The birds of the air, they don't plant in the ground. They don't, they don't sow and they don't reap, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Don't you think he's going to feed you? And he, he mentions all of these things that, you're not going to get everything you want, but you get what you need. And David says, you know, I've never seen the righteous go hungry. The people who are pleasing God and doing his will, God takes care of their needs. He just does. So this is true. It's truth. Is it absolute truth? Would I say we should add all of the lyrics from the Rolling Stones to the scriptures? Of course not, especially sympathy for the devil. I would never do that. So here, here's another one that you might be aware of. Tired of lying in the sunshine, staying home to watch the rain? You are young and life is long, and there's time to kill the day. Then one day you find that 10 years have got behind you. No one told you when to run. You missed the starting gun. How many of you recognize the, the lyrics in Pink Floyd? That's the song called Time. It's true. If, if you're of, of age and of many years as myself, you have more years behind you than you probably do in front of you. And you realize, oh my goodness, so much time has gone by. I've, I mean, I'm meeting people I knew that were this small that are now this big. I, I'm, I'm now seeing people come and go in their life and people move and how life changes. And I think, oh my goodness, how much time has gotten behind us? That's true. I find that to be true. And, you know, especially with this COVID thing, you could just sit around and lame out and do nothing and, you know, not make much of your life because there's nowhere to go, there's nothing to do. And so you can get tired of that, which is why I like being here. And yet, that's not absolute truth. It's truth, but it's not absolute truth. I just used it on the stage. These folks who probably don't know God, and I've mentioned them to support some biblical facts. So I don't think that Jude's doing anything different. So you don't have to sweat it and think, oh my goodness, he just quoted something else. Oh, Paul does this all the time. He quotes worldly prophets. He quotes even poets of his time, Greek poets. Uh, Cretans are always liars and evil brutes. He, he quotes these things all the time, and it's in the scripture. So what he does is he ratifies. He says, you know, these guys are right in this particular area, but they're not absolute truth, not directly from God and inspired, but you'll find pockets of truth here and there which you can incorporate and understand. You guys get that? Because there are a lot of people whacked out about this, I gotta tell you. I've done, I've done more study on two verses here in Jude than I think I've done in, in most of my other studies just about this, and I had to somehow explain all this to you. So there it is. So do we see anything like this in the Bible? Whenever you see something that, that seems out of place, that is just kind of thrown into the scriptures, what you want to do is look through the rest of the scriptures to see if there's anything like it. Uh, by the way, the ascension of Moses and uh, also the book of Enoch, which we're going to talk about first Enoch specifically because there are three. You're going to see uh, there are all sorts of things that come out of there. There's the book of Judas, the book of Thomas. There's as Estrus, there's Ecclesiasticus, there's all of these, Tobit, there are all of these things flying through my head. Sorry, uh, I don't need to tell you everything I'm thinking. But do we see anything like this in the scripture that would back it up? Actually, we do. In Zechariah chapter 3, verses 1 to 3 says this, then he showed me Joshua, this is Zechariah speaking, the high priest, this isn't Joshua, uh, the son of Nun, this is Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord and Satan standing at his right hand to oppose him. And the Lord said to Satan, the Lord rebuke you, Satan. Same exact phraseology. The Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Is this not a brand plucked from the fire? Now Joshua was clothed with filthy garments and was standing before the angel. Now, many of you may not know the, the soap opera digest version of what's going on here, but Joshua the high priest has gone to go serve the Lord and his garments are dirty. 
And the picture is in the spiritual realm. Here's the angel of the Lord. By the way, whenever you see the angel of the Lord, you should be sensitive. It's probably Jesus Christ, the messenger. Angel means messenger. Uh, if it was an angel of the Lord or he's named, then we know it's not. But anytime it's the angel, Jesus is the messenger of God. We, we know God because of Jesus. So he shows up and there's the devil as Joshua is going to present himself before God as a priest. And the devil's sitting there basically telling him, look, look what a dirty dog you are. You're completely unpresentable. You can't come before God looking like that. But you know the outside is always a picture of what's going on on the inside. And so his filthy garments are an indication that in his heart, he's not right. And the devil's there to accuse him, by the way. That's what the devil does. He accuses you. And who's standing there with him? The angel of the Lord. And the angel of the Lord says, and by the way, he calls him Lord. The Lord rebuke you. It's rather interesting. The Lord rebuke you. Satan, the Lord who has chosen Jerusalem, rebuke you. In other words, God's the one who's in charge, not you. Is this not a brand plucked from the fire? In other words, Joshua is basically a piece of wood that's been in the fire and is, is almost all burned up. And he's, you know, you and I would say, you know, he's a goner. But the Lord pulled him out and he uses him. And he says, he's vital and he's important to me. And so although you see the dirt and you're good about rubbing his face in it, that's not what I see. I see somebody who's been redeemed and pulled out of the fire and somebody who's going to be there for my use. And the rest of it goes on that the Lord changes his clothes for him and takes off his dirty clothes. And he says, now you're presentable. And it's a, it's a picture of redemption. It's a picture of how God takes every single one of us, and it doesn't matter who you are, unworthy, used up and damaged and God takes us and he uses us for his glory and he changes our hearts and our minds. Amen? Amen. So, didn't mean to get in a big thing about the passage but I thought you should know. This is the same exact wording as what you find in this, this uh, pseudopigrapha. So, it's, the principle is there and the principle is don't go up to the devil eye to eye and think you could take him on. The Lord rebuke you. Amen? Amen? And that is recognition of authority and being respectful. Even though you have authority, it gives you no right to pull rank because you can't do that. So show some respect and know your place. That's about the simplest Jersey way I could tell you. There are people that get all, you know, they get all excited. You know, I never see Jesus doing that when he casts out demons. He just says, go, be gone, come out of him. They didn't go smacking people and knocking them down and all that silliness. That's stage stuff. Have some respect, know your place, and allow the Lord to take care of things instead of you. He does a much better job. And it's clean. So, in Titus 1, 3, this is what we're told. Remind them to be subject to rulers and authorities, to obey, to be ready for every good work, to speak evil of no one. Speak evil of no one. To be peaceable, gentle, showing all humility to all men. Wouldn't you find it difficult to reconcile this scripture with the riots that are happening? Certainly. For we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving various lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. So what we, what we need to do is show that there's a demonstration in our lives that there's something different about us. Because the Lord has come in. And he's changed us. And how do you do that? You don't do that by fighting people on their turf and doing what they do. You do it like the Lord Jesus would have us do. Romans 13, 1 and 2 says, let every soul be subject to governing authorities. By the way, he's writing at the time when the Romans were in charge of everybody and they were persecuting and killing people at will. He says, you guys need to listen to the government. Governing authorities, for there's no authority except from God, and the authorities that exist are appointed by God. Therefore, whoever res resists the authority resists the ordinance of God, and those who resist will bring judgment on themselves. Yet you go, you go tangling with the law in that way, in a fleshly way, you're going to be in deep trouble, and you deserve it, because you're not listening to what the Scripture says. 
1 Peter 2, 13 and 14 says, Therefore submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake. You don't do it for theirs, you do it for the Lord. Whether to the king is supreme or to governors and those who are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers, for the praise of those who do good. Just in case you thought maybe it was just one scripture that said that, I just showed you three. There are others, but you get the gist, right? We're supposed to have a submissive heart to God, and in so doing, we submit to the authorities that are around us, right? Good. Glad you agree. Verse 10, but these meaning these apostates, they speak evil of what they do not know and whatever they know naturally, like brute beasts, in these things they corrupt themselves. Actually, it says in, in Peter's book that like brute beasts, they are, they are fit for nothing but to be captured <laughs> and put under control. So an intellectually ignorant arrogance. Have you ever seen people that don't know I, I see these interviews on the internet all the time. Somebody will go and challenge their position. So what do you believe? Well, we, we're just mad. Or what are you mad about? Well, about everything that's wrong and life sucks. <laughs> okay, so what's your position? It sucks. <laughs> so what are you gonna do? Oh, we're gonna cause trouble and we're gonna loot and we're gonna burn until we get what we want. What is it you want? Something different. Oh, please, do some thinking. Go away and figure out what it is that you're doing. You're jumping on a bandwagon, you know, just cut, cut it out. You don't even know who you are. So you got intellectually ignorant people. They're intellectually ignorant, and yet they're arrogant. They, they think they have the answers, and they don't. It's, I, I love it. I, I just, I, I wish I had someone here that was like that. <laughs> I do. I, I would just... You know, a pastor, you know, you could have done better. His service was, you know, pretty messed up with the scripture. I don't think you were right. Oh, here you go. Here you go. You can teach. Uh, yeah, why don't you put together, you know, a presentation, spend 40 hours and study and dig in the word and pray and, and all that. And then, then I'd, I'd be glad to hear what you have to say. I'll give the clicker to Scott Gregory. And so... Knowledge as a weapon. There are two things. They speak evil of what they do not know and whatever they know naturally, like brute beasts, and these things, they corrupt themselves. They corrupt themselves because they use knowledge as a weapon. Have you ever seen people take knowledge and use it as a weapon? You ever have, you ever have an argument with somebody and you're talking about things and then they bring up something that's just denigrating? So, so what do you stand for? Well. I'm definitely not on board with everything that's happening. Okay, great. So what does he want to do? Ugh, I don't know, but at least I'm not fat and old like you. Oh, that's, that's incredibly infantile. You see, because some people will just say things like that and try to squash other people with such statements, which have no content in and of themselves, and they have nothing to do with the issue. So. Don't get into arguments. I, that's what I do. The scripture says don't do that. It says the servant of the Lord must not quarrel. If you get into a fight on Facebook or Twitter and you get into this, oh, yeah, what, you do not know what spirit you are of. I'm thinking of the words of Jesus. So ignorance and natural instinct lead to corruption. You corrupt yourself. You look like a fool. It's basically what it is. So don't jump into the ring uh, with somebody and, and do something stupid. Woe to them, for they have gone in the way of Cain. They have run greedily in the error of Balaam for profit. They have perished in the rebellion of Korah. Just to give you an idea of what he's talking about, in Genesis chapter 4, the first physical murder that occurs is Cain. I say physical murder because the day that Adam and Eve ate of the fruit that they shouldn't have eaten from, they died spiritually. But the first physical murder was between two brothers, Cain and Abel. Cain and Abel were set up, and of course they have their own relationship with God, and they're going to carry that out. Cain does his own thing. He brings fruits and vegetables because that's what he does. He works the land. He's a farmer. He brings the, the fruits and the vegetables as a sacrifice to God. God doesn't accept his sacrifice. 
Abel brings the first fruits of his flock, and he comes and he sacrifices them, and there's a blood sacrifice before the Lord, which is what God has prescribed. Well, wait a minute. This is long before Moses showed up. This is long before the Levitical law. This is long before the sacrificial system, long before the temple. If you remember, as soon as Adam and Eve had sinned, God covered them with skins. The skins came from innocent animals whose blood had to be shed to cover their nakedness. God left an example of the sacrificial death of an innocent for the guilty, which Abel got. And he came before God in the way that God wanted him to. Cain comes before God in a way that God never prescribed because it was his own way. After all, I'm a farmer. What could be better than some fresh vegetables? But there's no sacrifice for sin. You see, you're making light of your sin then. And so his sacrifice was not accepted by God. And so God comes to Cain and says, hey, what's wrong with your face? It's the Jersey version. Why are you cast down? If you do what is good, will your countenance not be lifted up? In other words, won't you be happier just doing what I want you to do? And he says, it is sin's desire to have you, but you must rule over it. It's crouching at the door, and its desire is to, to devour you. But you've got to rule it. You've got to take over. But he doesn't listen to the advice of the Lord. It's funny how the Lord will come to you, and he'll tell you what to do before you get challenged. And if you don't take the advice, you end up tripping and falling. So that's what happens with Cain, and he kills his brother. In James 1, 19 to 20, says, So then, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, and slow to wrath or anger. For the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. You know, in the midst of your anger, you are not going to accomplish God's will. If you're going to try to extract a pound of flesh from somebody, you're not doing God's business in God's way. Amen? That was the sin of Cain. He let anger and envy and self-manufactured religion rule his life. The way he came before God is the way he wanted to, based upon the, the works of the ground of his own hands. And that was unacceptable before God. And there are a lot of people who do good things, and they do nice things, and they donate money, and they do all of these one things, the works of their hand, and they wonder why God's not happy with them because that's not what he wants. What he wants is their heart. What he wants is a relationship. What he wants is you to accept the unmerited favor of God by accepting Jesus Christ and his sacrifice on the cross for your sins. But you have to admit you're a sinner first, not somebody that does all these wonderful things. And so be careful of those things. Ephesians 4, 26 to 27 says, Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath nor give place to the devil. So you can be angry because anger is not a sin, by the way. There are certain things you should be angry about. There are certain things you shouldn't be angry about. Anger itself is not a sin. But you can sin in your anger. I mean, I might, I might be angry that I just told my kid not to do something and they're in the middle of doing it. I'm angry. What am I going to do with that anger? That's the question. So don't sin in your anger. Don't let the sun go down on your wrath. In other words, don't hold on to it so long. It's like leftovers in your fridge for a month. Get rid of it before the sun goes down. In other words, you got, the time is ticking. And when the sun goes down, you better have it resolved. Because you know what happens when you keep that stuff in the, in the fridge of your heart? It gets bad. And it contaminates your whole life. And all the words that come out of your face. And all the things you say on the phone. And all the stuff you write on the internet. It comes out in lots of ways. So, and don't give place to the devil because the devil will get a foothold in your heart and he will climb up into your head and pretty soon you'll wonder, how did I get this way? Amen? Don't go the way of Cain. It didn't work out well for Cain either. And uh, he ended up killing his brother. And I don't know about you, but bearing the death of his brother on his conscience, I can't imagine what that was like. And knowing that you did that because of envy and because of anger and because God didn't approve of you. Be careful of anger, envy, and works-based religiosity. Next is Balaam. 
about greed and godliness. He tried to combine the two. And of course, you can't combine the two. And you'll find this in Numbers chapter 22. If you remember, Balak came to him, the king, and he said, listen, I need you to come and curse these people. They're coming in droves, and they're, they're ransacking my property, and they're coming to take over, and, and God's with them, and I need you to come and curse them. And Balaam says, all right, let me check with God. He says, God, what do you want me to do? He goes, I don't want you to curse them. Those are my people. I'm with them. You should be on their team. So he comes out and he says, well, listen, I can't do that. God told me I couldn't do it. And they go, oh, I get it. You want more money. And so the envoys that were there went back. And then there, there were more special envoys with more fancy clothes and more cash in their pocket and came to Balaam and said, Balaam, we really need you to come, need you to do this thing. And he goes, I'll ask the Lord. You know, when God gives you an answer, he doesn't want you to get a second opinion. So he goes to God and gets a second opinion. He says, can I go do it now? And the Lord said, yeah, go ahead. Be careful if the Lord tells you to do something that he said you shouldn't do before. And so he goes, and on his way, there are three times his donkey pulls some stunts. He's been a good donkey all of his life, never had a problem. He scrapes up his leg, and he goes around. He sits down, and he won't move eventually. And so he's beating his donkey. He's beating his donkey, and the donkey looks at him and says, hey, haven't I always been a good donkey? <laughs> haven't I always been a good donkey? He says, you don't get it. There's an angel around the corner, and he's got a sword drawn, and he's going to take your head off. I'm trying to do you a favor here. And he's been there twice before. That's why I did what I did. So Balaam gets on his face, and the angel says, you better watch yourself, and you better say only what God tells you to say. I think he came around. So he goes, and he speaks over these people, and as he says, God, lead me in what to say, he speaks this blessing, and he prophesies. This guy is not by any shape a godly man. And yet God speaks through him like a radio station speaks through a radio. And he starts prophesying about the star of Israel that will come. And he's talking about the Messiah. And God just fills him with the Spirit. And he's prophesying. This dirty, godless prophet of Baal. And, of course, the king says, what are you doing? I told you to curse these guys. And he goes, well, you know, I can only do what the Lord tells me to do. He goes, well, maybe we're in a bad spot. Let's find a better spot. And they find a better spot where he can look. And so he opens the same, he does the same thing. He blesses them because he's saying only what God could tell them. And he's being obedient. He's, he's decided, I'm going to just say what God tells me to say. I'm not going to do what they paid me to do. And then after it's all over, the king is all disgusted. And he goes, listen, I can't say anything but what God wants me to say because I'm afraid I'm going to lose my head any moment. But I'm going to give you some advice. Take your ladies, your choice ladies, your good-looking ladies, have them wear something nice and sheer and go down and dance for the men of Israel and entice them physically, get them revved up, light their fuses, so to speak, and entice them to come back to their tent and sleep with them and maybe even intermarry and have children with them. And then you won't have to worry about anything because God will not be blessing them anymore. That's pretty twisted. And that's what they did. Well, it turns out that later on, when they come and take the property, you know, there's somebody who ends up dying. His name's Balaam. He ends up getting assassinated because he sides with the enemy, the godless ones. So this is not a godless man. He's an apostate, which is why he's on our triple threat list here. So Balaam is a triple threat. It says in 1 Timothy... For we brought nothing into this world and it's certain we can carry nothing out. Amen? And having food and clothing with these, we shall be content. By the way, that's the opposite of greed. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and harmful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition, which is basic alienation from God. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil for which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness 
and pierce themselves through with many sorrows. Because you know if you have any wealth at all, if you have any finances whatsoever, you know they must be managed well or you will lose them instantly. Or they will take your life away. You'll squander it and then you'll wonder, where did it all go? So don't be like Balaam. Don't fall for greed and try to combine godliness and greed. And there are people that do it. And I don't think they're any better than Balaam. Greed is not contentment. Contentment is a mark of somebody who knows the Lord Jesus Christ, who trusts that God has my soul at the highest priority and he loves me more than anyone else on the face of the planet and I don't have to worry about what is going on in this world and I don't have to seize, grab, take, or cajole something to my will. Amen? The third is Korah. They have perished in the rebellion of Korah. So he's the third of our triple threat. Korah is somebody who makes a power play for Moses. Korah, who was put in charge of things in the temple, he had a position of authority, but he wasn't Moses. Moses was chosen by God to be the deliverer, to bring the law, to bring structure and organization. Moses' job was to do that, and God chose him for exactly that. Now, we know Moses wasn't a perfect man, right? Well, Korah, seeing that Aaron, who's Moses' brother, so it seems like nepotism, puts him in charge of the priesthood, not knowing it's from God, and Korah says, listen, you guys take too much upon yourselves. You think you're all that in a bag of chips. You're in charge. You're telling us what to do. You're treating us like you're a king, telling us what to do. Who are you to tell us what to do? Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Moses falls flat on his face before God, instantly praying. And he says, you know what? This is what we'll do. You guys take your censers, your, your incense holders. You know, like if you've been to a Catholic church, they, they do the thing, you know. You take those things, light some incense. You and the 250 people that are following you, you go over here. And Aaron and myself will be over here and we'll be presenting incense before the Lord, and we'll see who the Lord accepts. And if you guys live a long, natural life, and if you don't die, then I'm wrong. But if the Lord swallows you whole into the ground, well, then we'll know who God favors. And they were like, good, let's do it. And so they do it. And so the Lord tells Moses, okay, light everything up. Everybody's lit up. And, of course, that's a picture of incense. It's a picture of prayers before God. Except these folks are doing it out of a rebellion to authority. Moses and Aaron are doing it in obedience to God. And so what, did, what happens? Moses says, everybody, get back from the tents of Korah and, and Dathan and these, these other guys. Stand back. Stands back. And he says, you know what? If the Lord doesn't swallow you whole, then I'm wrong. And guess what happens? The ground opens up and swallows them. 250 people, including the tents of Dathan and his buddy, who wouldn't even come out. They, they were all me, 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 me behind his back, but they wouldn't even show up for the event. He says, stand back from their tents. Their tents, their wives, their children, everything they own gets sucked up into the ground, and you can hear their screams as they go down, the scripture says. And the ground then closed and they disappeared from the face of the planet, just like that. And everybody was shaken and scared and said, Moses will do whatever you say from now on. <laughs> so God spoke that day. Korah had a rebellion in his heart, and he's a demonstration of what happens when you speak against dignitaries, those in positions of power, or when you speak against authority. So Korah got taken down with all of his boys down into the ground. Sad thing is, they were their wives and their children and all their possessions went with them. Because our sin is never private, by the way. It always sucks other people in. And there are innocent people that end up suffering because of it. <sighs> Beware of superiority over service. Be careful if you think that you want to take charge instead of serve. And I realize I'm the guy up in the front of the room telling you that. 
I'm the pastor after all, telling you all that. The day that I decide that you're here to serve me is the day you should fire me and get rid of me. I am here to serve you. And that is the only way that anyone in a position of authority should be. You need to be the servant of all, as Jesus said. You want to be the greatest? You want to be the head of the show? You got to be the servant of everyone. So, sorry, I'm preaching myself in front of you. Verse 12. These, these people, these apostates, are spots in your love feasts. Now, he's, he's going to talk about uh, very poetic terms of these people, and he's going to compare them, all sorts of things. They are spots in your love feast. And when you get together and you eat, it actually could be read, you, these are rocks in the water as you guys sail through and you're having your, your dinner cruise, if you will. So these are like rocks, which, you know, you, you think everything's going well and you're going to come upon a rock, which isn't good. While they feast with you without fear, serving only themselves, they are clouds without water. By the way, clouds without water were worthless to people, the desert people, who are looking for rain. They need crops to grow. They need their animals fed. A, a, a cloud without rain is just... It's giving the promise of vitality in life, and yet it has none in it. Carried by the winds, late autumn trees without fruit. And by the way, late autumn trees are supposed to have fruit, like you know when you go apple picking and that kind of thing. Twice dead, pulled up by the roots. In other words, there's no hope of them changing. Raging waves of the sea, foaming up their own shame. In other words, they make a lot of noise, and, and they, they show uh, all kinds of... Uh, words, and yet there's nothing produced, like the waves that just keep coming and nothing's being produced. It's just noise. And it says, foaming up to their own shame, wandering stars in whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. He's saying these guys are shooting stars. You know, they come out of nowhere and they, they make a lot of fire and a lot of fizzle and it's like, ooh, like fireworks. And yet they're gone. They're of no worth. Stars continue to give light. Shooting stars give light for a little while they're gone. So be careful of shooting stars. And you can't set you know, your sextant by them. You can't set your course by them because they're mobile. They're, they're never staying in the same place. And so these folks are never settled down to the place where you say, these, these guys can be a guide for me and I can follow them. Because if you follow a shooting star, you'll end up crashing along with it. So he's using all of these poetic metaphors to explain who these folks are and reserve for them as the blackness of darkness forever, which is also said of the devil and his angels, by the way, which was never created for human beings until we decided to follow his plan. Now, Enoch, you guys know Enoch, right? You've been in the book of Enoch recently? Now, Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied about these men also, saying... Behold, the Lord comes with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment on all, to convict all who are ungodly among them, and all their ungodly deeds in which they have committed in an ungodly way, and all of the harsh things which ungodly sinners have spoken against them. Now, interesting question. Why does Jude quote from an apocryphal book, the book of Enoch? First Enoch, by the way. There are three First Enoch. If you've never read through Enoch, it's very long. It's been comprised of many authors, many people have put in there, and the language in which it was originally written was around the time of Isaiah and Daniel. There's a language that is used only until that point. So this wasn't the Enoch that you and I understand, the seventh from Adam, but this is something that probably got copied down and added to and added to and added to. Uh, if you finally get to chapter 71, there's a vision where Enoch is taken up into heaven, and we get to find out who the Messiah is. You, guess, you, you want to guess who the Messiah is in chapter 71? Enoch's the Messiah. That's why it's not in your Bible. Just so you know. Anyway, that's one of the reasons it's not in your Bible. But here he quotes from the book because you guys now know the difference between truth and absolute truth, right? It may have been written by Enoch well, well into the past, and then when it was copied over, there were people that figured, eh, I'll just add a little of my own imagination here. And they pulled from a lot of the scriptures, and they put it together, so you say, my goodness, this sounds like a scripture. 
It was some probably well-intentioned person writing a story, uh, you know, put it on par with C.S. Lewis. So the Book of Enoch, are there lost books? Is the Bible complete? Any of you asked this question of yourselves before? By the way, the scripture mentions no less than 30 books that we don't have. There are 28 in the Old Testament. There are two in the New Testament. In 1 Corinthians, Paul writes, and he says, just like I wrote to you before. Wait a minute. This is 1 Corinthians. We don't have what came before 1 Corinthians. It's rather interesting. He talks about the gospel that went to Laodicea, Paul talks about in another place. And he says, you guys exchange letters and, uh, you know, you read the letter that I gave them and, uh, and you can read the letter I sent to them. And we don't have it. Those are the two in the New Testament. And then there are 28 in the Old Testament, the annals of the kings of Egypt or, or of Israel and the annals of the kings of Judah and 26 more that we don't have. They're simply gone from the face of the planet. Why are they not part of our Bible? Because we don't have them. They're gone. So, do you feel like, wow, really? And what about all these lost books? You know, there's the book of Thomas, the book of Judas, which is, is a godless work. Um, I can tell you, if you read these things, it's absolutely bonkers. I mean, he talks about other gods and how there's an evil god of creation, and it, uh, it's just weird. So, it's, it's whack in, in, the, in, the, in the scholastic term. It's whack. So is the Bible complete? Well, let me tell you what the Bible says here in John chapter 20, verses 30 and 31. And truly, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. <gasps> By the way, you don't have the full story. <laughs> but these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. By the way, Jesus did a whole bunch of other stuff that's not even written. In fact, it's said that if everything were to be written down that Jesus did, the books of the world would not have enough room to contain what he's done. Because it would go all the way back to creation, wouldn't it? In 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3 says, As his divine power has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. If you believe it from Peter, if you believe that we have all things for life and godliness, then you believe the Bible's complete and we have what we need. Through the knowledge of him who called us by his glory and virtue. So are there lost books? Should you be curious? Should you read these things? Trust me, people with a much bigger head than you have gone through it, sifted it through, and checked the archaeology. It, it's whack. So you will have to wait until you get home for the whole story. And I can tell you there's... there's you can go into the book of Tobit or Judith or Bell and the Dragon and... The, or, you could get into all kinds of other books where probably men have added to and twisted and vomited their own vile perspective on. I can tell you that the 66 books of, of the Old and New Testament, they're reliable and they are canon. We recognize them as coming from God, solid. So, moving on. So what does the scripture say, at least the one that the Spirit of God said, yeah, you could use this and make sure you tell people about it. What does it say? It says there'll be judgment. It says that the Lord comes with 10,000s of his saints. Who's he coming with? Us. 10,000s of his saints to execute judgment on most of them. No, they're coming to execute judgment on all to convict all who are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds, which they committed in an ungodly way. So they did bad stuff, and they did it in a, in a bad way. And all of the harsh things which ungodly sinners have spoken against them. They do it because they're sinners. You know, people sin. They're not sinners because they sin. They sin because they're sinners. You see? It's something that comes out of their nature. It's not something, oh, well, I did something wrong. I must be, I must be wrong. No, you are wrong. And that's why you do wrong things. We're sinners, and so we sin. I'm not a sinner because I sin. I'm a, I'm a sinner, and that's why I sin. Anyway, people don't want to admit that. Oh, we're all good people. Can't we all get along? It doesn't happen. So, <laughs> Revelation chapter 19 talks about 
John's vision, he says, now when I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on it was called Faithful and True. And in righteousness, he judges and makes war. By the way, that's Jesus Christ. His eyes were like a flame of fire, and his head were many crowns, which means he's the king of all. He had a name written that no one knew except himself. He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood. And his name is called the Word of God. We know who that is. That's Jesus Christ. And the armies of heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. Symbol of purity. Now, out of his mouth comes a sharp sword. In other words, you're going to be judged by God's Word. And with it should strike the nations. By the way, that's not you and I. And he himself will rule over them with a rod of iron. That, that means authority. He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness of the wrath of God Almighty. God himself sends his son, Jesus Christ, to execute judgment because he is worthy to judge. He is worthy to open the scroll and he is worthy to judge. So Philippians 2, 9 and 11 says, Therefore God has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name that at the name Jesus every knee should bow of those in heaven and those on earth and those under the earth, that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father, because Jesus Christ ultimately is the judge, and he will come back for his people before he comes and judges the nation. So that's essentially what it says, regardless of where it comes from and all of the confusion it may have caused by me trying to explain it. Going on in verse 16, these are grumblers, Complainers, walking according to their own lusts and with their mouth great swelling words, flattering people to gain advantage. Uh, have you heard of telemarketers? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Grumblers. Grumblers are those who grumble against God. They grumble against God. You know, why am I so short? Why am I so fat in the middle? Why am I, you know, we grumble against God about God. That's what a grumbler does. A complainer is against others and circumstances, just so that you understand. Complaining is, you know, how could he possibly wear that shirt? You know, we're complaining against one another or a situation or something that's going on. Oh, my goodness, I can't believe what's happening. That's complaining. Just thought I'd tell you. Lustful means selfish and feeling driven. You know, feelings are way overrated, by the way. Feelings are important that you know that you have them and you know how they got there and you know how to deal with them and you deal with the damage of your past and all that. But if you're going to live your life according to your feelings, the Bible calls it living according to your flesh. If I feel like eating a pizza, I'll eat a pizza. If I'm a diabetic and I feel like eating ice cream, I'm going to eat ice cream. You better shut down your feelings. Manipulative orators, they come with flattery and they use other people. Um, this has become an art. You know what telemarketers are. So people like to use their words to control you. I love telemarketers, and uh, I actually did some telemarketing, forgive me. And they <laughs> tell you how you, can, how you can cut off everyone's exit from saying no. So tell me about yourself. And they ask certain questions, and then later when you say, no, I don't think so, they say, oh, well, you already told me this, and you already told me this, so why would you say no? Certainly you believe it's a logical thing for you to say yes to what I'm telling you. Are you happy with your phone service? Well, honestly, no, I'm not. Oh, OK, good. I got a great deal for you. No, thank you. Well, you just told me you're unhappy with your phone service. <laughs> yeah, I did, but I like punishment. Click. <laughs> you know, just. <laughs> but then you feel like an idiot because you're just completely illogical, and they cornered you, right? I'm sorry. I've digressed again. <laughs> but there are people that will try to put strings on you and control you and tell you what to do. And these apostates know how to do it. They know how to use the English language or any other language to control you, to manipulate you, to make you feel guilty, to throw guilt trips on you. They know how to do it. They know how to cut you up and make you think, why do I believe in Jesus Christ again? Love people, not things. Use things, not people. You know, this world has it backwards. Because they use people and they love things. Don't be like an apostate and be careful of your heart because the world will rub off on you and you'll be pressed into its mold before you know it. Verse 17, but you, here's the good news, but you, beloved, those who are loved by God, remember the words which were spoken by the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. By the way, 
You want to know something that's canon? Read something the apostles wrote. How they told you that there would be mockers in the last time who would walk according to their own ungodly lusts. These are sensual or feeling-oriented people who cause divisions, not having the spirit. So the first thing that we're encouraged to do as his beloved is to remember. And you have to remember the scriptures. Remember what the Bible says. And I don't know how much time you spend trying to memorize the scripture. Obviously, it's my job, and they pay me to do so. But I did it long before you ever paid me. And I think it's important that that's what we do. We spend time in God's word, or we spend listening to God's word, or studying God's word, and hiding it in our hearts so that we might not sin against God. We remember what God has said. Ephesians 4, 2, and 3 says, With all lowliness and gentleness, with long suffering, which is patience, bearing with one another in love. By the way, that's what we do. If you're irritated by somebody here, I'm not surprised. I could be the very person you're irritated by. The scripture says you've got to deal with me. I'll try not to usurp that over you. Endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. Endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. Do you know that when we have an elder meeting and we talk about decisions, we have a leadership meeting, I don't want to do anything unless we have total agreement. If we have one person that doesn't agree, that, that isn't willing to say, okay, listen, maybe, maybe I'm not 100% on board, but let's do it. If, if, if one person has got something in their craw about it, we don't do it. Because the scripture says, endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. Because for us to agree is more important than forcing any particular agenda or moving forward at light speed. And I've, I've been accused of doing that, and I've done it. So I want to keep the bond of peace. In, act, in uh, Romans 8, 9 says, But you are not in the flesh, but the spirit, if indeed the spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he is not his. If you say that you're a believer and you don't have the spirit of God inside you, you don't know him. And you don't walk according to the flesh, you walk according to the spirit. But if you don't have the spirit, you're not his. The spirit of God has got to be dwelling in you or you don't know him. So it's just that simple. Verse 20, but you, beloved, building yourselves up in the most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God. That's a peculiar statement, isn't it? Looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ into eternal life. First thing we're told to do is building up yourselves in the most holy faith. You know, if you want to build something, you've got to do a good foundation. This is a picture of World Trade Center. They called it the pit before they rebuilt it. They built those foundations very deep, multiple floors deep. First thing you have to do is build, and you have to build on a good, solid foundation. We are responsible for the building, by the way. The scripture says so. We're not responsible for the foundation. We're not responsible for the cornerstone. That's Jesus Christ. We are, however, responsible for building ourselves up in the most holy faith. So if you're not spiritually strong, you can't blame God, right? Just, just say yes. So build. He says praying in the Holy Spirit. And by the way, praying in the Holy Spirit means that you, it, it's not mechanical. It's not like maybe what you think it is. Praying in the Spirit is not babbling endlessly, falling on the ground. Praying in the Spirit is not any of those things. It is praying to God from the Spirit of God that lives within you. And it's not telling God what to do, but it's asking God, what would you have me pray for? And allowing the Spirit of God to guide your prayers. If you want your prayers answered, you'll allow the Spirit of God to tell you what to pray because they're things that God already wants to do. And when you pray those things that God already wants to do, he goes, I'm so glad you asked. We pray in the spirit. And what we do is we keep ourselves in the love of God. It doesn't mean that you keep God loving you. Don't misunderstand that. Well, if I'm a good boy, God will love me. If I'm a bad boy, God doesn't love me anymore. That's not it. Keeping yourself in the love of God is keeping yourself under the spout where the blessings come out. It's keeping in a place where you might be the recipient of all the great and wonderful things of God's love 
instead of his chastisement, which is his love anyway. But if you want all of the benefits of God's mercy and his grace upon you, you have to stay under the spout where the blessings come out. One of the reasons I come to church is because this is the spout where the blessings come out. I love you people. And I need you people in my life just like you need me. I want to stay under the spout where the blessings come out, which means I want to do whatever it is God wants me to do. I want to do it in his way. I want to do it with love. I want to be an example of Jesus Christ. I know I'm his ambassador, but so are you and no less so. I want to stay under the spout where his blessings come out. And we are to look. We are to look for the mercy of the Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. One of the aspects of being a Christian is you look for the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. His imminent return could happen at any moment. How many of you know that? Certainly now more than ever. And on some, this is how we're to behave on some, have compassion, making a distinction. But others, save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment defiled by flesh. It's, it's a little difficult to follow, but let's talk about it. There are some you have compassion on. There are some people you have compassion on. You know, that means that there are some people you don't have compassion on? Like the apostates. I will pray that God turn you around, but all, indication, all indicators tell me you're not going to turn around. And I will do what I can to pray for you, but I will give you over to God's judgment. On some, have compassion. And you know, there are those with limited capacity, both mentally, physically, and spiritually. And we are to uphold one another and help one another. And so we have to have compassion on one another. Not, not everybody is as smart as you, like me. I need compassion. So have compassion on me, will you? It says that some save with fear... And, and the, you know, hating even the garment defiled by the flesh, it's, it's like you're rescuing someone from a fire. You're running into a burning building. By the way, you know, you put yourself at risk when you run into a burning building. You know, you're probably going to burn up your favorite shirt going into that burning building. You're probably going to torch your shoes going into that burning building. And you might learn your, you might leave, leave this earth. You might sacrifice your life running into that burning building after somebody. And yet... There are some people we run into the fire for. And if you're, if you're willing to stand outside and let them burn, what does that say about your commitment to Christ? And so some, we rush into the fire. We save them with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment defiled by flesh. You can do a whole study on garments. Jesus had a garment that was separated, and they bit on it. Joseph had a garment which was had long sleeves and it was multicolored and indicated he didn't do any work. And yet when he was in Pharaoh's household, it was the garment that he got caught by. So anyway, I'm running out of time. I got to go. <laughs> you hate the garment even defiled by flesh. Listen, if, if, you, if you go into a fire, it might cost you your life, but you can go into a fire and come out of it with your life and still be singed. And what you do is you change those clothes and you get rid of them and you, get, you could get some on you. If you're in the business of saving souls, if you're in the business of edifying, strengthening, bringing the gospel to unbelievers, you're going to rub elbows with them. Be careful that you don't get any on you. Make sure you get, get rid of that garment and you get rid of it and you get clean before the Lord again. That's what it means. So one we do is we show love. Number two, we show an urgency because life is not forever, boys and girls, on this earth. We show an urgency. And what we do is we stay clean, make sure in the midst of doing God's business that we don't compromise on the word of God. Last verses. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling. Thank you, Jesus. He's able to keep you from fumbling on the road in those places where it's not smooth and easy. To present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy, because by the way, you will graduate this life, and the Lord will take you and introduce you to everybody there, to God, our Savior, who alone is wise, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. Amen.
There is a day in which the Lord will guide you home, and he has the ability to do so for you. He will do it. But be aware we have an enemy. Be aware there are apostates, and they don't work for the Lord. They're working for our enemy. But for you, the Lord will guide you home. Pray that you're comforted and strengthened by these things in Jesus' name.